While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are your tr- your why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still didn't believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what's written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you and I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Anthony. Why don't we pray together? Let's keep praying. Lord, thank you that your promise was that as we turn to you, you bring times of refreshing as we repent. And help us hear your voice today, Lord. Help us turn to you. Even as I speak, we pray, Lord, that you would refresh us, that your spirit would be continuing to move in this meeting and this time together. Amen. Amen. Well, the last few weeks have been an interesting time, to say the least, in our country, haven't they? Interesting is to massively understate it. It's been a time of unrest, uncertainty, confusion. There was the absolutely tragic... Uh, murder of three girls in Southport, and so we've seen political violence, anger, rioting, and we had to move our prayer meeting on Wednesday evening from here because we're uncertain as to what was going to happen in the city centre. It just about worked out in the vicarage. But it can be confusing. Why are people rioting? Why are people taking to the streets? Uh, As we look at the news at the moment, it can be overwhelming. You know, hearing about young Girls being murdered is one thing, but then understanding what to do with the violent response is another. Uh, It's a bit scary. As I say, we moved our prayer meeting just because we didn't know what was happening and we wanted to be safe. Perhaps like you, you might be thinking, what is the Christian response at the moment to these things? How do we respond? And of course, one thing to do is to pray, isn't it? To pray that the Prince of Peace will be ruling and reigning at this time. But I suppose today's sermon is a bit of a response. As we look at this account of the resurrection, it's a bit of a response to what's happening. Because people need to know that Jesus is alive. They need to know that God's real and God's interested in them and he calls them to live in a certain way. But that God has shown himself, he's revealed himself in Jesus and he's defeated death as he has come back to life. And so let's look at verse 36 again. What does Jesus say to his disciples when they've just seen him come? While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And Jesus uttering these words is also set in the context of violence. Because our passage that we're jumping in today in Luke's gospel is set just after the events of the public sentencing and then execution of Jesus on a cross outside Jerusalem. You know, these disciples that we're reading about who are startled in this moment have seen him flogged, they've seen him scorned, they've seen him hung on a cross, dying in the most public way possible. 
And that's why Luke records while they were still talking about this, because they're still talking about the events of what's happened. But Jesus says this phrase, peace be with you. And I suppose Jesus wants to say the same thing to us today, and he wants to say the same thing to you. Peace be with you. As you consider the events of our city and the nation at the moment, peace be with you, says Jesus. But God also doesn't want, just want to reassure us today, I think, with his words of comfort, the Prince of Peace saying, peace be with you. I think he wants to reassure us today with the events of the resurrection. Because as we look at this, we're going to look at the foundation of the Christian faith, this truth that we have to proclaim to a hurting world and an even a violent one. Let's just look at again the details of the scene. Look at verse 37 with me. They were startled and frightened, having just seen Jesus, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. In this moment, they're startled, they're frightened because they've seen Jesus die. They've seen him die in the most awful way possible. They've seen him taken off the cross and buried. And there Jesus is standing right before them. So he says, don't be troubled. Look, it's me. Look, you can even see the holes in my hands and my feet. And then he does something that, in this story at least, might seem a bit particular. Look at verse 41. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? It's a question I like to ask people. Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Jesus asked for them for something to eat and it's designed to show one thing very, very clearly. It's meant to tell us, it's meant to show the disciples at the time that Jesus is alive. Dead men don't eat fish. You know, he's saying, look, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a ghost. Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me. Look, it's me. And then just to prove it even more, he says, do you have any food? And they give to him the the thing that the fishermen would have, of course, broiled fish, and he eats it in their presence. And the world, our city, our friends and family need to see and encounter the risen Lord Jesus, don't they? They need to see the one who hasn't just died for our sin, but has risen again and defeated death. If you like, they need to see Jesus standing before them with his scars, saying, it's me, I'm here. People need to know that Jesus is alive. And as I think about people, when people see injustice and they see violence, they need to know God, who is going to judge one day with perfect justice. He's going to judge our violence and our sinfulness. He's, God looks on the injustice on the world and says, I'm going to judge that in my son. People need to know that. But also people need to know that God has dealt with their own sin, don't they? How easy is it to look at, say, violent things happening on the street and look down on other people and think, gosh, they're so bad. These bad people, these evil people even, what are they doing? And overlook the darkness in our own hearts that might not be expressed in the same way, but is there in every single one of us. So people need to know, don't they, that Jesus is alive, he's coming back as judge, but also he has reconciled us to God as we turn to him in faith. And the resurrection, when you look at it, when you consider the, the kind of evidence of it, I think gives us amazing proof. It's an amazing foundation for our faith. And in classic kind of preacher fashion, I've got some PPs for us. So the danger is with our faith that we make it all personal and private, as it's all about me and my personal relationship with the Lord. And isn't it amazing that we can have a personal and private relationship with God? But the resurrection shows us some particular things. Firstly, the resurrection was promised prophetically. Promised prophetically. Look at verse 44 with me. This is Jesus speaking in this moment to the disciples. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds 
so that they could understand the scriptures. Oh Lord, how we need that. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I do find it amazing that how often Jesus has to remind his disciples who've heard everything he says. If you ever feel like you need reminding and you don't always get it and you are learning things again and you're discovering things in your faith that you've discovered before because you need to hear them again, take heart because that's just like the disciples. There they were with Jesus and he needs to remind them again of the things he's already told them. This is what I told you while I was with you. And then he points out that his death and his rising and people witnessing to it was promised prophetically. It was promised prophetically. And this means, as we think about our faith and our, the faith that we have to proclaim to the world around us, it isn't just based on our own private experiences, but it's based on the word of God. Jesus has fulfilled so many prophecies about him. There are over 800 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Prophecy just means something that was foretold that is to come. Here's a selection of them coming up on the screen. Here are some things that were said about Jesus, about the Messiah. Let me just pick out a few to them, a few of them. That the Messiah, that's Jesus, would be born in Bethlehem, that he had entered Jerusalem on a donkey, his hands and feet would be pierced, that's from the Psalms, that God's Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that's from Zechariah. The people even would gamble for his garments, that's again Psalm 22, that his side would be pierced, again Zechariah and that he would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. And that's from Isaiah 53. And you can read the hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his coming and his dying and his rising again. And the thing I take come from these is, because you might say, well, Jesus, you know, he was a very clever man. He looked at the things that were written about God's Messiah, and then he decided to arrange his life in such a way that he would fulfill all of them. Well, the thing is, if you take things like him being born in Bethlehem, that was something that he had no control over. As Jesus came, he was coming and uh, fulfilling the prophecies about him. He was the one who had been long promised prophetically. And someone has calculated the odds of Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies that he did. Um, the odds of just these 16, 17 prophecies, excuse me, being coming to pass is apparently one chance in 480 billion, billion, trillion. So that's the number 480 followed by 30 zeros. The odds of Jesus fulfilling these things that were said about him is absolutely astronomical. And yet that is the basis of the Christian faith. Jesus was promised prophetically. Our faith isn't just based on our own private experience, but what God has said he would do and then has done. So the uh, resurrection was promised prophetically, but also it was, excuse me for the PPs, preached in power Preached in power, look at verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. I'm gonna send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Just as we need our minds and hearts open to the word of God. Oh, how we need his power. Jesus here is referring to the day of Pentecost. Stay where you are in Jerusalem until you've been clothed, which is the events from Acts and the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, I'm gonna send you a helper who's gonna anoint you for the task that I've given you of being my witnesses, to preach in power what you have seen with your own eyes. And guess what? The Holy Spirit has been at work. He's been very busy. Here we are, sat today in Bristol in 2024, because God moved then and because his disciples took the message and they spread it all over the world. Just think about that. Here we are. We totally take it for granted, don't we? Yeah, I go to church on Sunday mornings. Yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. We trust that a carpenter from Nazareth is the son of God because of the gospel being preached in power by these men. And it's something that millions and billions of people have attested to. So our, again, our faith, what we have to say to the world, isn't just something that's in our own heads. It's not just confined to this church here, which is slightly quieter in the summer, you know. 
It's not just confined to us. It's something that is held and preached and believed in by billions of people, even now around the world and has been believed before. So the resurrection was promised prophetically. It was preached in power and then publicly proven. Publicly proven. Look at verse 39 again. Look at my hands and my feet, said Jesus. It's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. The resurrection of Jesus isn't just a good idea. It's something that eyewitnesses saw themselves and they had a chance even to test. And I find the accounts of the resurrection and the disciples encountering Jesus to have the ring of truth. I relate to Thomas. What does Thomas do? No way. Not believe in it? Absolutely not. I believe it when I see it with my own eyes. Do you ever say that? It's what we all do and still do. And yet Jesus invites him to come and to touch his wounds. So our faith, let's remember this, is based on what people really saw. These accounts that we read, like from Luke, are based on eyewitness testimonies. They saw Jesus do the miracles and they wrote it down and they passed it on. They saw Jesus die and yet they see him now being raised to life. And there are accounts also in the New Testament of uh, Jesus coming back. Think about chapters 22 and 23 of Luke. Uh, We see Jesus appearing on the road to Emmaus. In our passage, appearing to his disciples. And elsewhere, it'll talk about Jesus appearing to 500 people. The resurrection has been promised prophetically, preached in power, but also publicly proven. Dead men don't eat fish. They don't come back and say, "Mm, I'm peckish. What have you got for me to eat? Which, as I say, sounds like something that I like to say. And how will this good news go and be received by the world today? Or let's just narrow it in to this city, or even just to our friendship circles and our family. How will people know about this good news? How will they hear about the one who was promised prophetically? How will they know about the one who has proven publicly his resurrection? Well, it will be as we fulfill what Jesus commanded his disciples to do. Look again, just go back to verse 48, Jack. You are witnesses of these things. I'm gonna send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So we, people are gonna hear about Jesus as we preach, as we share, as we tell them what God's done. And we're gonna consider that more a bit more in September when we look at uh, Jesus sending out the 72. So we also, like these men, are witnesses for God. You know, we get to testify about what God has done. That's why we're gonna do this at the banquet on the 12th of September. Do you remember we had Luke and Tara up to hear about their testimony? They shared about their journey, the way that God has brought them out of a very, just real darkness in their own lives, out of addiction, out of prison. And we're gonna invite people, perhaps just like that, our neighbors in the city to come here to be fed and to hear testimonies about what the Lord has done. We're gonna share with them, we're gonna tell them, hopefully in a way that isn't totally bashing them about the head with it, but is real and is God-centered. We're gonna tell people about Jesus. That's why we need to run the Alpha course. That's why in our own lives we need to gossip the gospel, as somebody once said. We need to tell people. We need to demonstrate the love of God when we pray for people. Somebody once said that we owe the world an encounter with God. What does Jesus say? Stay in the city until you've received power from on high. Do you ever feel like you aren't very effective in sharing Jesus? Me too. Guess why that is? It's because on our own, we can do nothing. We too need the power of God. We need the power of God. Maybe even in the miraculous, maybe even in things like words of knowledge, maybe even in, you know, answers to prayer as we pray for people. But let me just suggest something else because we will focus on those things at other times in other sermons here. We've been going through a sermon series together as a church called A New Command. A New Command. Why? It's because Jesus, elsewhere in the Gospel of John, said this. It's gonna come up on the screen. I've said it a couple of times now. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our love for one another as Christians is so important. It's not just incidental. It's not just a nice thing that we should do. Our love for one another is to be based on Jesus' model of love as in self-sacrificial, self-giving love. And it is in part how we are identified as followers of Jesus. What does Jesus say? By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. How? If you love one another. And if that's like a come down now, Joan. How are we identified as followers of God? Well, it will be as we tell them. But if our lives don't match up to that, people are going to see through it quite quickly. What's one of the criticisms that I hear most of the church or Christians? Maybe you've heard this too. It would be the accusation of hypocrisy, as in Christians not practicing what they preach. Are the way we treat one another in the church is, if you like, something that backs up what we say we believe. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And here's my contention. The world, our city, our friends and family need to hear that Jesus is alive. How are they gonna see that though? Well, it's gonna be as we grow together as a church that genuinely and sincerely loves one another. It might be to show the love of God through hospitality, which we considered a couple of weeks ago. Last week, I spoke about favoritism, not preferring some people over others. We have to love one another. Firstly, because Jesus commanded it, and secondly, because it's so important for our mission. It identifies us as followers of Jesus. Now, this is, I think, quite simple, possibly more simple than we make it out to be. Um, there's an image of the Turkish shooter, Yusuf Dikic, that has gone viral for his calm and pretty casual demeanor at the Olympics that have been happening in Paris. So this image of the guy on the right has been going viral. So he won a silver medal shooting in the 10 meter team event and he looked like this. And people have been contrasting it. This is South Korea's Kim Ye, Kim Ye Ji's. And she is in this pose and she's got these specialized glasses on. This is what everyone does. They get into a certain pose to lock their arm and they wear a set of glasses, one to do some magnification and the other one to block it out. But the Turkish man just put his hand in his pocket, had both eyes open, and then one silver. And I think there's something in this for us. Go with me here. The great danger, let's just keep it up, Jack. The great danger is in the Christian life, as you think about what it means to be the kind of church that God has called us to be, we think, ah, well, I've got to do it exactly right and I've got to get the right strategy and I've got to do it in the right way and that means training and that means equipment effectively. You know, we think living out what Jesus means might look a bit like that, a bit weird, a bit specialised. You need the right equipment to do it with. But go with me again. I think it looks a bit more like this. It's a lot simpler than we make it out to be. Following Jesus and sharing him with others is a lot simpler than we make it out to be. It doesn't mean we're, I mean, that looks pretty casual, doesn't it? We're not just casual necessarily. But Jesus says, how the world is gonna know you're my disciples if you love one another? That's it. If you love one another, it's gonna back up what you say. It's not, here's my 10-step strategy for sharing the gospel. It's not, here's the thing you need to do. Here's the specialized training you need to do. And we do need to do those things. You know, we just run Alpha. We're gonna to train to do Alpha properly. But as you think about your life, I think living for Jesus looks a lot more like that <laughs> than it does like that. Now we can have the slide down, Jack. And this is also true for what it means to love one another. Because you might say, Tim, here you are again in this sermon series saying, you've got to love one another. You've got to love one another. You've got to love one another. What does that mean? And I would just say, it probably means exactly what you think it means. If we went round this room and said, what do you think it means to be a church that grows in love? We'd get some absolutely brilliant answers. Because we already know what it means. 
It means things like on a Sunday, we aren't just in our little cliques. We all talk to one another. We're friends with one another. It means that we offer to pray for one another. It means we remember the things that someone has shared with you. If you're like me, sometimes you need to write down in the notes app of your phone the things that somebody shared, because otherwise I won't remember. But there are these extra conscientious people who I think probably are better Christians, and they just remember things about people. But how amazing is it when someone remembers your name and remembers the thing, hey, I've been praying for that thing that you mentioned, that situation. Isn't that really simple? That is kind of the thing that Jesus told us to do. He told us that this means that our friend, Christian friendships are meant to be different. Christian friendships are meant to be different. Even in the way that we do our friendships, even in the way that our family life is ordered, is a witness to the world. And what God promises to do, by this the whole world will know my disciples, is to use the way that we love one another to testify to the amazing foundational truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, our love testifies to something that has changed history, that has proven that God is real. Jesus is the one who has promised prophetically, who has preached publicly, who publicly proved all that God had called him to do. And even in the way that we love one another, that's gonna be a sign to people that they come and know Jesus too. And we have to be careful as we talk about love. I've just said, loving one another probably means exactly what we think it means. And of course that is true, isn't it, to a point. If you think what it means to live self-sacrificially in this church, that probably means the kind of things that we think it means. But we do need to be careful. What's the phrase that we see in our society? Love is love. Love is love, people say. As if love is something that is self evident and we might go with that up to a point but of course as Christians we say well God's love God is love 1 John 4 and therefore God gets to set the terms of what love is like and so when we talk about love we do it in line with God's word but it is lining lines with God's word that we need to live and we do that to be a witness to people But also, I just want to address something here. When I talk about the resurrection, I suppose I am saying that there is evidence for the Christian faith. There's good evidence, eyewitness evidence for the Christian faith. When judges and juries in trials are given evidence, they're given historical evidence, not scientific proof, they're given historical evidence, accounts of what has happened. And if you like, that's what we have in the resurrection accounts. That's what we're reading in Luke's gospel today. But we might be a bit like the disciples. Jesus speaks to them and he has to say, peace be with you. But then just look at verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? And I just want to say that that might be some of us, even here today, or maybe you're listening to this on the podcast. Do you ever have doubts about God? Do you ever think to yourself in the quiet sometimes, is it all really true? Because I do sometimes. You know, I remember I've done alpha courses with various people and say, well, do you ever doubt? Well, maybe. Maybe I'm more apathetic than I doubt sometimes. We should probably do a whole sermon on this, but I just want to say that Jesus speaks to you today to say not just peace be with you as you think about the uncertainty of the world, but he also says to you, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? I stand right in front of you as the risen Lord Jesus. If you do ever doubt, can I just say this? It's very normal. Lots of people go through it if you're following Jesus. Secondly, please speak to someone. So we talk about what it is to love one another. Why don't you just share that with someone, someone that you trust? Hey, sometimes I have doubts. And you know what might, they might find, find them say? Yeah, me too sometimes. There's that great prayer we can pray. Do you know it from the New Testament? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's the kind of prayer we can pray together. But if you do ever find yourself doubting, be reminded today that God has proven it's all true and it's all real 
by rising, raising Jesus Christ from the dead. As you listen, as you hear this eyewitness testimony from the Gospel of Luke, let it reassure you today that Jesus has really come from the dead. But here's another thing for us. Our love for one another, the way that we live together as a church, isn't just a missional thing as in the world sees that the love of God through us, but it's something that is gonna reassure one another. It's gonna encourage us together. This church needs to continue to be and grow in being a place where people find such encouragement in their faith. Where iron sharpens iron, to use the biblical imagery. Where people are given confidence in the gospel. And how will people have confidence in the gospel? Well, it's as simple as the way that we love one another. Oh, look, here are these other people trusting the same thing that I do. Here are these other people living out the truth that we all say that we believe. And here are these people that treat me differently based on the thing that we share and believe together. Someone once said that church is meant to be like a coal fire, full of coals. And what happens in a coal fire is that as one coal burns, it heats up the others around it. And as soon as you take a coal out of the fire, it can begin to grow cold. But as soon as you put it back, it grows warm again. And that's meant to be a picture of the church. We encourage one another, we stir one another on. And so let's be a church that loves one another as Jesus did. Let's be a church that loves one another as Jesus did, that lays down our life for each other, just as Jesus laid down his life for us. So that the world might see the truth of our testimony, but also so that we might all grow in God, so that we might see Jesus before us. Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet, it's I myself, so that we might see Jesus before us, even in the way that we love one another. Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you that you, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, stand among us today and say, peace be with you. And today we receive your peace. Lord, if our hearts and minds are troubled as we think about the world, we receive your peace today. Lord, if our hearts and minds are troubled because we know sometimes that we doubt, we receive your peace today. Lord, we receive your peace and we seek your power today. Lord, we wanna be a church that lives out all that you have for us. And we just confess that we cannot do it in our own strength. We need the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, even to be loving to one another, to forgive well, to listen well, to serve well, to wash each other's feet. And so, Lord, as we wait together, we pray that you would fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that you're here, but we pray now that you'd come and rest on us afresh by the Spirit. Lord, we want to receive today all that you have for us. Please come and fill us afresh, we pray. Help us live in the way that you called us to live. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand together?